The break of dawn is departure time on the bridge linking a collapsing Venezuela with a Colombia straining under the burden of the new and the needy. Venezuelans getting out for good or maybe just for a while. Dire deeds that have become routine. They've done without vaccines, essential medication and food. Diseases once thought eradicated are back. People keep coming and Colombia keeps adjusting. But you see some people here with expired passports, and that's because there isn't the paper, there isn't the ink, there isn't the money to get new passports. And Colombia and Ecuador and Peru have all had to accept that if they see Venezuelans with expired passports, they just have to let them in because these people have no choice. How bad must home be to have no choice? This bad. With the help of a colleague in Venezuela, CBC got access to images of life there just this weekend. All those cars are waiting for gas. It took three minutes to ride alongside the lineup and find its end. ¿Cómo se siente usted estar acá desde las 4 de la mañana? Bastante indignado. ¿Por porque qué? esto ya se volvió fue costumbre. Esto ya nos acostumbraron. El Estado venezolano, el gobierno ya nos acostumbró fue a esto. Some wait find nothing or what they find they can't afford. That flat of 30 eggs, rare to see, harder to buy. With daily limits on ATM withdrawals, it would take six days to get the cash to pay for the eggs if you had the money. Hospital wards that aren't closed are dangerously ill-equipped and filthy. No water in the sinks, but it's dripping from the ceilings in the dialysis area. There aren't drugs or supplies. What happens if you're sick? What happens if you're Isabel Carascal? We met her in the Colombian border city of Cucuta, out of Venezuela for five months, not in great shape. Neither is her little one, Roxy Bell. Remember what I told you, her mom says, when one door closes, another one opens. Isabel left because she couldn't get care for her ovarian cancer. The Colombians helped out. She's just had more surgery on her kidneys, needs chemo and radiation. But she came to this church shelter looking for guidance about her health care and didn't find any answers. I feel very vulnerable. She says, I'd like to give my children many things, but I can't. I can't work in my condition. Quiet Roxy Bell. She's intelligent, her mom says, but not in school because that means money for uniforms and books. Aid agencies do their best to help, but Colombia doesn't have a shelter system in place. So many are on their own now. How does Isabel fare at night? Well, this is it. Two rooms shared with six people. Yo no me hubiese venido en ningún momento. Unlike others, I would have stayed in Venezuela. I didn't want to leave, she said. But to just live meant she had to leave. No water, nowhere to really sleep, certainly no place to recover from cancer. But this is life on the run from a state once dripping in oil and wealth. Venezuela has tried to reassure its people all will be just fine and it has a plan. Starting September 1st, the government increased the minimum wage to 34 times its previous value. There are deep suspicions about whether that will work, but here's the most audacious move of all. The government issued a new banknote by taking the old one and just lopping off five zeros. But what gives it any value? Maduro has pinned his hopes on a digital buzzword. There was orchestrated fanfare in February when President Maduro blessed hard drives and announced his plan to save the economy. Y hoy están haciendo el niño. El niño feliz, el Petro. The Petro, a government-sanctioned cryptocurrency. And if you don't know how those work, spare a thought for millions of Venezuelans who are in the same boat. Nevertheless, Maduro tied the country's wages and pensions to this digital currency. But the pitch was really aimed at international investors. Buy a Petro and get digital dollars that are secure, verifiable, and free of central bank manipulation. The twist, as its name suggests, is that a Petro is backed by something in the real world, oil. Specifically, the government says five billion barrels of oil reserves in northeast Venezuela. Sounds promising, but... The Petro doesn't appear actually to exist. 
Brian Ellsworth is a Reuters journalist. He visited the region and found no signs of any oil development, save for some decades-old equipment. What he did find? Hungry people force-fed this mythical money. We ended up walking into the school. This teacher, she said, this uh, situation is so severe that kids don't eat at home anymore, which means they stop coming to school. And by the way, I got this call from the education ministry that said, now we need to explain to our children what the virtues of the Petro are. And she said to me, I don't know what a Petro is. Beyond widespread confusion, Ellsworth says the Petro isn't being traded on any major exchanges. It's not being used in shops. Few people even own it. The suggestion, it's all a fundraising scheme. They do appear to have raised maybe $100,000, $150,000. I think that's actually a fraction of what your average um, crypto scam can raise. Um, so, yeah, they, they made a few bucks off it. It's not a significant amount of money for a country of this size. Maybe it's an attempt by a government banking on an old devotion of oil to try to fool Venezuelans with a flashy new trend. Doesn't seem like they're buying it. Today, Canadian officials attended meetings at the UN to talk about solutions to the Venezuelan crisis. And we asked how this country is helping with real currency. Global Affairs Canada said it is providing $900,000 in funding. Some of that will go towards monitoring and reporting on human rights and giving support to human rights defenders. The rest will help bring together Venezuelan experts to work on some sort of negotiated solution to the crisis. And so, Adrian, you've given us a clear sense of the scale of this problem, and it's staggering. Tell us, what are you working on for tomorrow? Well, we've been listening to people talk about hard numbers, you know, 5,000 coming across every day as opposed to 2,000. And it's been occurring to us that, in a way, it doesn't make much sense because those are the people who cross officially on the border. They're being counted. But we've been watching people cross the river, come through the bush. No one's counting them. This is a huge problem for Colombian authorities because have they been vaccinated? How do they make sure they don't disappear into the underworld here? Who's looking after them? Where are they going to go? So we're going to look at that. We're also going to look at the smuggling operations that have sprung up. It's amazing. Venezuelans, we've watched them bringing things like car parts and meat here, you know, meats that, that's not available there in Venezuela, but bringing it here to Colombia, selling it for hard currency to take back to Venezuela.